if we're right, if we're right, that assumption alone, I have been in the markets for a long time. And as new asset classes evolve, uh, what institutions do in particular is they tiptoe in, they start with 1%. And, uh, and then they, uh, and then they migrate to two, uh, and then they migrate to five. So I think in this one, it's two and a half percent for the base case. Uh, when there's a new asset class, it tends to end up in the five to 6% range. This happened uh, to real estate. Uh, it happened to private equity, venture capital, which is now much more than uh, 6% in many institutional uh, funds. Uh, it happened to the whole category of uh, emerging markets. Uh, and so uh, I, I think it's that, that one alone is very conservative. Uh, and if you look at uh, another one, um, the uh, corporate balance sheets, Tesla, Square have a Bitcoin on the balance sheets, uh, but uh, we, we make very uh, cautious assumptions. And I think the uh, corporate treasury assumption is two and a half percent of all cash and cash equivalents in Bitcoin. And the bull case is 5%. Uh, if we're right and the purchasing power of Bitcoin um, becomes so obvious in the years ahead, meaning uh, the, the purchasing power goes up instead of cash, dollars, staying pretty flat, uh, if not in real terms deteriorating, um, then more and more corporate treasuries are going to be putting uh, Bitcoin on their balance sheets. And in fact, uh, uh, they'll be uh, the, the analysts will start question at questioning them. Why are you why why do you have, you know, 95% uh, of your cash in a depreciation depreciating asset when you could put it into uh, a cash equivalent like Bitcoin and have an appreciating asset. So first, global, private, meaning no government intervention. Uh, rules base uh, if I didn't say digital I should say it now digital monetary system uh, that the world has ever known it is a very big idea and in fact what I often do is describe uh, what Art Laffer said to me uh, after he finished reading the paper and you know he, he basically said I think I might have mentioned it you know I've been waiting for this since they closed the gold window. You know, monetary policy has been completely unhinged. There's no discipline. We're going through booms and busts that are completely unnecessary. Um, and, I, and I did say to him, I said, you know, if we went back to a private money, and I'll get back to how, you, how, how we help people understand this. Uh, he's very excited about a private money, but you know, in studying the history of private money in the United States prior to the Fed, 1913, I said, but Art, you know, that was a period of booms and busts. And he said, yes, but they happened very quickly. The, what we're doing with monetary policy right now, the, the, they happened quickly back then without a tr terrible amount of damage. What we do these days is plug the dikes, and uh, make one monetary mistake after another, and we end up in a, a global massive crisis that takes years to get over. Um, so, so that was interesting. Um, and I did say at the time, I said, well, Art, if this is such a big idea, how big is it? And he said, well, how big is the US monetary base, the reserve currency's monetary base? Back then it was four and a half trillion. Today it's eight trillion. He said, there's your answer. There's your answer of how big this could be if this is going to become an effective global monetary system. Uh, and so we ran with it and we have not stopped running because you're right, we have just begun. And it is interesting to note that, you know, we're up to 19, billion, bit, I mean, million Bitcoin. 
and we're going to 21 million. So the scarcity value argument, the store of value, uh, is going to resonate even more uh, because I believe when the SEC does relent, and it will, uh, now that uh, Chairman Gary Gensler is calling, you know, the controversy around the Bitcoin uh, ETF his personal Vietnam, uh, uh, so he probably wants to get rid of it. Uh, we, uh, our uh, COO, Tom Stout, feels that um, we will have, not we, maybe a many people, many firms will be approved for a Bitcoin ETF. And when that happens, uh, that, that will bring with it an institutional uh, acceptance uh, that really could highlight the scarcity value of Bitcoin. Um, and, and institutions are not the only story. Um, if, uh, uh, thank you for reading our Big Ideas uh, 2023. And in there, you see our building blocks to um, a six to $650,000 price uh, and perhaps one to one and a half million dollar price by 2030. Um, we, think, we think most people in the world, at the very least, should have some of their assets in Bitcoin as an insurance policy against confiscation of wealth. And that can happen in a number of ways. It can happen outright. So to see MBS in Saudi Arabia lock his co cousins up in the Ritz Hotel and just take their wealth, that's confiscation. That's outright confiscation. Uh, and then, of course, there's inflation, which is also confiscation of wealth. It's a cruel tax. It's very regressive. And Bitcoin um, would be a, 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 an important hedge against that for, for anyone, but especially for lower income people. Um, so now with the ETF, what is going on? Uh, I think, you know, we know the research people at the SEC and they know what they're talking about. They are really good. We've met uh, the head of FinHub now who reports directly to uh, uh, Chairman Gensler. And for me, the disconnect is they know so much and they are so good uh, that um, I believe this was much more Gary Gensler standing in the way. Um, I don't know for sure because they could never say something like that. I just know from uh, how, they, how we have discussed uh, Bitcoin with them that they really understand it and they understand its merits, uh, most important. Uh, so this is Gary Gensler. Why he allowed, and I will say he because I think uh, he's the getting factor here, why he allowed a Bitcoin futures uh, ETF, which involves counterparty risk and not a Bitcoin ETF, which does not involve counterparty risk. In fact, it, it is backed, ours would be backed by Bitcoin one for one in cold storage at Coinbase. Uh, that, that's why Grayscale has won its case. It is that argument. And, and so uh, I, I think Gary Gensler's personal Vietnam is coming, uh, is coming around to haunt him. I do think the, the SEC is moving now. He has, in effect, said, hey, I'm not the only decision maker. There are five commissioners here. That means some of the research uh, that we believe is percolating up to those commissioners might uh, be getting through to them and uh, might be the grounds now for the approval of a Bitcoin ETF. And we don't think that, that the SEC will approve just one. Uh, they will probably approve a group of them. And that means it will become uh, a marketing battle. And, and we do hope that uh, our research, how much we uh, a, you know, give away our research, mostly because uh, we feel it very important to educate. It's one of our mission and values. Uh, we hope that that, uh, that helps us as we, uh, hopefully being one of those approved, 
go out and start marketing. I really want to hit that $1 million price prediction by 2030. And uh, I have your your chart that I pulled up from Big Ideas. I'll probably put it up on the screen if you're watching this on video. The bear case is 258000 per Bitcoin. The base case, 682000 and the bull case, 1.48 million as your price target. Can you talk to me a little bit about how your team uh, reached this conclusion? Because folks out there, again, they think they're late, but this shows that, I mean, the compounded growth rate every single year, they're very, very early, and this has a huge asymmetric potential. Yes, if you look at the little table on that page, uh, you'll see the building blocks and how conservative they are. Uh, I think, now this is from memory, and uh, sometimes I get one big ideas uh, and another uh, mixed up, but I think the institutional allocation to Bitcoin in the base case, uh, I know at one point we said two and a half percent, that may have gone down a little, but uh, if we're right, if we're right, that assumption alone, I have been in the markets for a long time, and as new asset classes evolve, uh, what institutions do in particular is they tiptoe in, they start with 1%, and, uh, and, then they, uh, and then they migrate to two, uh, and then they migrate to five. So I think in this one, it's two and a half percent for the base case. Uh, when there's a new asset class, it tends to end up in the five to 6% range. This happened uh, to real estate. Uh, it happened to private equity, venture capital, which is now much more than uh, 6% in many institutional uh, funds. Uh, it happened to the whole category of uh, emerging markets. Uh, and so uh, I, I think it's that, that one alone is very conservative. Uh, and if you look at uh, another one, um, the uh, corporate balance sheets, Tesla, Square have a Bitcoin on the balance sheets, uh, but uh, we, we make very uh, cautious assumptions. And I think the uh, corporate treasury assumption is two and a half percent of all cash and cash equivalents in Bitcoin. And the bull case is five percent. Uh, if we're right and the purchasing power of Bitcoin um, becomes so obvious in the years ahead, meaning uh, the, the purchasing power goes up instead of cash, dollars, staying pretty flat, uh, if not in real terms, deteriorating, um, then more and more corporate treasuries are going to be putting uh, Bitcoin on their balance sheets. And in fact, uh, uh, they'll be uh, the, the analysts will start question at questioning them. Why are you why why do you have, you know, 95% uh, of your cash in a depreciation depreciating asset when you could put it into uh, a cash equivalent like Bitcoin and have an appreciating asset. So um, remittances is another very big market. We assume 10% uh, of remittances in the base case and. 25%, you know, instantaneous, no fees or minimal fees compared to 8% fees as migrants send back to their home countries. Uh, sovereign sovereign uh, treasuries, uh, 1%, only 1% in the base case, 5% in the bull. Uh, just like corporate treasuries, uh, they'll be under pressure uh, to start increasing their exposure to Bitcoin. Uh, and uh, emerging markets, not just uh, the, the state treasuries, but uh, all of the populations who are subject to these swings in their currencies uh, and, and absolute demolition of their wealth uh, when they go through hyperinflations. We assume 3% of, of the populations in the emerging markets, 3% uh, of their assets in the base case uh, go to Bitcoin and 10% in the bull. So those are uh, those are some of the cases. And then there's the very the utility the other utility economic settlement network uh, case, and that's five percent of all settlements uh, in the base case and ten percent in the bull case. So that that gives you uh, a sense of 
how we have uh, how we have uh, built those two estimates, and those are pretty conservative uh, assumptions. We would su suggest.